I actually, I don't know where my disclosure slide went, but uh, my first disclosure is that, uh, actually, could we put the lights on, up a bit in the room so I can uh, see who I'm talking to? Um, si on peut juste allumer les lumières? Oui, parfait. Um, uh, so I'm not, my first disclosure is that I'm, I'm not an expert in ileus, but of course, as a surgeon, that never stopped me from giving my strong opinion about something. So uh, that, that's really my only disclosures. And also, I, I want to thank a lot of our uh, co-workers and colleagues for uh, giving me their slides and, uh, and, 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 their, and presenting some of their work for them. So my goals in this talk are that at the end of this talk, I would like you in the audience to be able to give a definition of postoperative ileus and its clinical relevance, to explain a little bit the pathogenesis and contributing factors in ileus, uh, to list effective strategies to reduce the duration of ileus, and some are uh, things that we're all very familiar with, and some might be a little bit of new, uh, uh, new information. And I think w another thing that I think we should talk about is an ERAS kind of concept. Um, and of course, uh, many people here, if not most people, have been so instrumental in, in, in inspiring uh, me and us in our group. Uh, in the whole concept, but I think uh, some, something will be good to work on as well are sort of having contingency plans for some of the common uh, reasons we see for people who uh, may not do as well on these pathways as we would like. Um, and I'll give you an idea of a, a contingency plan or an algorithm that we're working on um, for uh, ileus or really symptoms of ileus, and some of which might be post-operative nausea and vomiting, so there's some uh, definition issues there too. So. Um, of course, postoperative ileus is, is, is a burden um, on our patients. Um, and we see symptoms, and maybe some of them are definitions. Some is postoperative ileus. If you're talking about the first, uh, some of them is postoperative nausea and vomiting, and where does ileus uh, take over from nausea and vomiting? Um, but we see symptoms of GI tract symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal extension, et cetera, in 40% of our patients uh, on, on pathways. Um, it's, it's, it has been and continues to be the most common reason for delayed discharge from the hospital for after abdominal surgery. Um, and recurrent um, symptoms of ileus are probably the most common reason for readmission uh, or one of the most common reasons. That's a very expensive problem. And it's a key goal, as we heard yesterday as well, in uh, enhanced recovery pathways to prevent ileus because it really is the first, uh, when that domino falls, it, uh, as we'll talk about, it kind of uh, disrupts everything downstream as well. So let's start with a definition because um, um, it's like uh, what Justice Potter said about obscenity. He didn't have to define it. He knows it when he sees it. But basically, I think it's very important to have uh, a definition of ileus. And certainly when we're doing um, clinical studies, um, uh, it, it, it's very easy to fall into the trap of, of calling maybe post-operative nausea and vomiting ileus, or, and the definition is important. So the definition, consensus definition, is the transient cessation of coordinated bowel motility after surgical intervention, which prevents effective transit of intestinal contents or tolerance of oral intake. And it can be primary or it's secondary when it's in the context of having other complications like abscess or leak. And I think what's important in this definition are two, or there's two kind of parts in it. The first part says that the transient cessation, it, okay, so the transient cessation of coordinated bowel motility is, is normal, or it's thought to be normal or expected after any uh, abdominal surgery, um, but it's only called ileus when, it, when, it, when, when patients develop symptoms of it. And the implication is that um, most patients tolerate this uh, kind of common or expected outcome of, of surgical intervention very well. If we go back to, you know, when we were in surgery school, we learned uh, that um, this normal hypomotility after surgery uh, resolves differentially depending on uh, the, the area of the GI tract that you're looking at, uh, so that there's a very quick, relatively quick return of small bowel motility within several hours, that it takes between 12 hours and two days for a gastric motility to return, and it can take uh, between one and five days uh, for complete recovery of colonic motility. And this is a nice uh, picture from Netter that I think obviously evokes uh, all of the symptoms, and, uh, or we could just use Dr. Gan's uh, video that we just saw with the pea soup of what patients with obstruction or uh, either paralytic ileus or obstruction look like, and I don't have to tell you what they look like. 
uh, with nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, pain, uh, and obviously the inability to advance their diet and not passing gas or stool. Now, of course, the consequences as, uh, um, are, are obvious as well. So the discomfort that's associated with it, and then we don't want to use opiates in these patients, and we can't use the GI tract to deliver um, uh, effective therapies, um, uh, patient anxiety, and the NG2, which is a um, very, very common response to these symptoms, uh, also uh, obviously has its own uh, issues and delaying nutrition, other complications, including aspiration, which um, is a very serious complication of ileus um, and can have very serious uh, repercussions. And I think the, the, one of the things we hear um, in clinical practice when we use these pathways is that our patient, a resident will tell us, or, or, or a staff or a colleague, or nursing staff will say, oh, that patient, no, he failed the pathway. The patient's off the pathway because um, because of any of these things, and that's probably the most reason for labeling a patient as being off the pathway. Once they're off the pathway, it's hard to get them back on the pathway. It's done. Um, uh, in order to understand uh, a little bit about uh, some of the um, modalities used to prevent uh, or to, uh, to diminish the duration of ileus, a little bit of uh, just a review of some of the major uh, factors contributing to a postoperative ileus. Uh, I think it's uh, good to review. Uh, so the, the initiating uh, stimulus is um, surgical incisions and manipulation of the viscera. Uh, some of the important um, pathways include uh, uh, sympathetic uh, inhibitory uh, reflexes, uh, which uh, um, uh, contribute to very strongly one of the most important mechanisms in postoperative ileus. So we heard a lot about uh, uh, trying to uh, prevent uh, these reflexes. Uh, inflammatory responses, either systemic or a lot of work in the um, pathophysiology at the level of the bowel. And there's some really every year beautiful reviews, uh, very interesting, a lot of, a lot, huge amount of science um, about the inflammatory mechanisms this, the, at, at the macrophage, mast cell, neutrophil level. Um, hormonal responses that are, of course, systemic hormonal responses, but also the enteric or GI physiology, GI hormones huge amount of information and, and very interesting work here. And of course, opiates, both endogenous opiates and exogenous, and um, uh, a lot of interest in the role of uh, excess fluids in contributing to edema of the bowel wall and also uh, contributing to, to, to ileus. Now, what I'd like to do is really kind of review some of the major um, factors that, that can be used to, um, to have an impact on, on the recovery or, or, or the time of recovery of ileus. And I'm going to touch on um, a lot of, uh, just to kind of review where we are in some of uh, the literature here, and, and uh, particularly about local anesthetics, either thoracic or delivered uh, systemically. Uh, which as surgeons, so as using IV lidocaine, for example, we, we may not as surgeons be very familiar with that. Um, and some of the, um, the uh, other factors that can be used, like um, albimapan, which we don't use in Canada, we don't have, I don't know, if we'll talk about it, but I don't know if anybody here is using that in Europe. Um, laxatives, uh, sham feeding or, or real feeding, sham feeding with chewing gum and real feeding. Uh, laparoscopic surgery uh, and some of the uh, uh, issues with uh, goal-directed fluid therapy, uh, et cetera. So just as a, as a context for, for going through and populating some of these. And I think as we do that, it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the evidence, uh, are the studies, they look at the single modality and not controlling for uh, other factors that we know are so important as well uh, in, in contributing to the duration of ileus. And so when, when you look at the studies, you always keep in the back of their mind, of your mind, which which other modalities were controlled for in those studies and which, which weren't, because some may not have the same uh, relevance anymore. <clears throat> so starting um, with um, uh, epidural, uh, local, local anesthetic, and I'm a big fan of epidurals, um, and we have excellent, obviously, expertise in our place and have for a long time. And if I was going to have open surgery, I would definitely want to have an epidural. Um, so what I'm going to, uh, so, because uh, clearly it accelerates the return of, of bowel function and provides excellent analgesia and the patients look great by blocking sympathetic uh, inhibitory stimuli to the intestine. Um, but if we look at laparoscopic surgery, uh, it's a little bit of a different story and in, in our place we do, you know, about 80% of the colon resections are laparoscopic 
and the data in, in the context of laparoscopic surgery uh, does not show the same, um, the same superiority for uh, thoracic epidural analgesia, either for, uh, uh, either for return of bowel function uh, and, and for analgesia, uh, and it uh, uh, complicates management in some ways. Uh, some of the downsides uh, in laparoscopy particularly, uh, one of the downsides we have is that in North America, the patients leave the PACU and, and they go to the ward. It's very rare that they'll go to the ICU or, or a step-down unit or a high dependency unit. So all we have to treat arterial hypotension is fluids <clears throat> and um, that uh, obviously can lead to other complications or other issues with, especially when we're trying to... Um, uh, we're trying to avoid fluid access uh, to try to uh, decrease in, uh, ileus. Uh, it's another line for patients to, uh, to carry around. We like them to, you know, we, we, and, and in our place it's, it's on a pump. Uh, it's not a small little uh, package that they can clip onto their belt. It's an actual another pump. Uh, when we're using single dose low molecular weight heparin dosing, we have to be careful about uh, when the dose is given, when we want to take out the epidural. Uh, so it's not that it can't be done, obviously it can be done, and it can be done very well, but it has to be attended to, uh, to avoid rare complications and also common complications uh, like urinary tension in about, uh, in, in maybe 10%. So IV lidocaine, so if, if local, we're talking about local anesthetic delivering at epidural, so what about local anesthetics delivered um, systemically? The IV lidocaine has uh, analgesic and antihyperalgesic properties as well as anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and if you look at systematic reviews, and these are small uh, studies in abdominal surgery and a variety of kinds of abdominal surgery, cholecyst from cholecystectomy to, uh, to, more, um, to, to more major uh, surgery, uh, showing uh, properties like decreasing duration of ileus uh, uh, um, with the uh, weighted mean difference of about nine hours. Uh, decreased length of stay, decreasing pain, and decreasing incidence of nausea and vomiting. Um, and I thank uh, Gabrielle Baldini for, for uh, these concepts here because um, there's a lot of issues with the literature. This is very, this is sort of more emerging uh, literature, so there's a lot of differences in the, in the doses that are given when uh, lidocaine is given, whether pre-op, intra-op, if it's continued post-op. Uh, the groups that are compared, so it's only one study that we found with comparing IV lidocaine to post-operative um, thoracic epidural analgesia, which is, I guess, more what we're interested in here uh, for the ileus factors and looking at recovery of, um, of bowel function, and that's what I'm talking about, not so much the analgetic properties, but recovery of bowel function. Uh, for open surgery, thoracic epidural analgesia um, seems uh, better, uh, to clearly better than IV opiates with uh, patient-controlled analgesia, IV lidocaine better than IV uh, uh, opiates, and uh, thoracic epidural at this point uh, better than, but at least one study showing equivalent to for return of bowel function with some of the uh, issues in the uh, study design. Uh, the main one is that uh, these, are, uh, these are powered as superiority studies and not non-inferiority studies, which will need a lot more uh, a lot more data. When we look at laparoscopic surgery, just looking at return of bowel function, it doesn't seem to matter uh, which kind of um, a modality you use. Um, and so uh, for colon surgery, and maybe it's different for rectal surgery, but for colon surgery, it probably doesn't matter what you use. And the new player on the block is uh, uh, intrathecal morphine, intrathecal local analgesia with intrathecal morphine, one dose in the operating room, spinal. Um, which uh, in this study uh, was superior to um, epidural and both are, uh, uh, which was equivalent to uh, intravenous opiates for um, some of these uh, ileus functions like uh, the time to first bowel movement. So that's probably very interesting for uh, laparoscopic colon surgery. Looking at prokinetics, um, uh, also a large uh, review of, of a, a lot of small studies. Uh, interesting that, uh, so alvimapan is a um, peripheral uh, mu receptor antagonist uh, which has some positive effects. I don't know, if, is, is it used in, in Europe? Do people, anybody in this audience use alvimapan in their patients? No, and we don't use it either. Do you use it, uh, Julie? Yeah, so in the United States it's approved in this indication. It's not approved in Canada. So it's something that has positive effects, but I could say most people around the world don't use it, whereas metoclopramide, a motilin agonist, erythromycin, uh, some people do use that, but does not have an effect, so it's kind of a little bit of a funny situation. Uh, Albumapam, um, the, uh, the data uh, 
would suggest that for open bowel resection in the context of using uh, IV opiates, so not using uh, uh, thoracic uh, uh, local anesthetics, um, in, uh, in, in pathways that do have a component of early feeding, it does have a uh, earlier return of, uh, of bowel function by about 18 hours. Uh, there's no studies to my knowledge, or large studies anyways, randomized studies looking at laparoscopy. And of course, it's sort of moot for us since we don't have it anyways, and it's expensive. Uh, turning to something that's sort of uh, poor man's, uh, poor man's alvimapan, not really, but uh, looking at laxatives, easy to give, and uh, um, for magnesium oxide, with at least three studies that I'm aware of where it shows sort of conflicting results. Uh, uh, a larger study uh, recently showing no, no effect in uh, colorectal resection in the context of when it's added to an enhanced recovery pathway. Uh, Bisacodal too, either suppository or orally, uh, may have um, uh, may have some effect. And coffee, I don't know if people have seen a couple of studies. I know I've this one's published, and I've I think I've reviewed uh, one or two lately. So I think we'll see a couple more studies coming out. Um, so coffee stimulates colonic activity in healthy volunteers, and uh, this is a randomized study randomizing this dose particular dose and brand of, I don't know if it was sponsored by them, but um, maybe they have to disclose that, that at the beginning of their talks, I don't know. But uh, this is a randomized trial that takes three cups of coffee a day until bowel movement uh, in the context of enhanced recovery pathway and showing a faster uh, first uh, bowel movement uh, for the patients to coffee, and it's not very expensive. People like to drink coffee anyways. For people who like to drink coffee, it might be one of those easy things to, uh, to do. It doesn't seem to have a huge downside. I don't know how sleep is affected. Certainly good for surgeons, but... Uh, okay, sham feeding, another thing that's inexpensive and doesn't have a big downside. So sham feeding with gum chewing, stimulating that cephalic vagal uh, reflex. Um, so looking at seven studies, six of them are in colon uh, resection. Uh, they're not in uh, fast track uh, surgery, they're with, uh, they're with open surgery, uh, showing um, that's beneficial in reducing the period of ileus, uh, time to first bowel movement on, on a weighted mean difference of about a day. So if sham feeding works, shouldn't real feeding work to accelerate bowel function? Because if, it, if it's working as a sham feed, then one might think that real feeding would have even better, um, better results. Uh, now, of course, uh, one of the key components that of, of enhanced recovery pathways that I think has really been a game changer is the idea that um, we don't have to wait for resolution, complete resolution of ileus at the hypomotility resolution for, to feed our patients. And that is, I think, is a big, is a big idea that's come out of this uh, people in this room that I think has had a big, big impact on people. Um, so early feeding within 24 hours does not increase complications. So in my day, if I fed um, when I was training in, in the in 20, 25 years ago, I would have been I would have been fired if I uh, gave uh, my attending surgeons patients if I gave them Jello at any time before they pass gas. It would be I wouldn't be here. That's for sure. Um, and then you know so that that was what we learned and that was that was very important and and so these studies are reassuring that it didn't we thought that you give them food and they'll blow up their gut and then they'll blow out your anastomosis and uh, and of course that would be that would be horrible and um, but it doesn't have any increase in, in surgical complications and it, it reduces may have benefits as well of course and all the med it has other I'm just talking about for ileus it obviously has other benefits to not starve people and it, but it does, I think it's, of course it does, it does increase the risk of vomiting um, when we feed patients earlier. Uh, and, but, but I'm talking just about ileus, really focusing on ileus in this talk. So let's just look at the impact on time to first bowel movement um, in, uh, in, in randomized studies. And it may have a, a small effect, but um, uh, not, not a huge effect. Just on that particular indication, it's indicated for other reasons, obviously. Laparoscopic surgery um, uh, does have an impact on decreasing the duration of ileus by about a day. <clears throat> and the, the most elegant uh, uh, support for this idea uh, using, instead of, we were, I was talking about for time to bowel movement and, and whether that's a very good outcome uh, for ileus, we, we can certainly uh, discuss, but that's the outcome that's, that are in the papers. But this is an elegant uh, look with uh, uh, radio uh, uh, labeled uh, uh, 
uh, meal, uh, looking at colonic transit uh, in the LAFA trial and showing uh, nicely that uh, uh, laparoscopic plus fast track uh, had a, a better colonic transit at uh, this day two and day three, better than open and fast track, and uh, both were better than, uh, than with standard uh, pathways. And both are independent predictors of improved colonic motility. But they actually didn't have an interaction between the two. Uh, they weren't in, in, as independent predictors, but both were independent predictors of uh, improved colonic motility. This is Tim's slide that I took from him when he came to McGill last year. Uh, and it's a nice slide about fluid, um, fluid management and the challenges there uh, in getting it right and not having too little, uh, having hypovolemia and, 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 and not putting any blood flow to our anastomosis and other organs that are theoretically important outside of the abdomen, and uh, or avoiding overloading our patients, causing edema and also uh, poor outcomes as well, and getting just into that sweet spot of just the right amount of fluid. And I think um, when with studies that, were, that have been done looking at uh, not, not giving too much fluid, the idea of restricting fluid uh, are confusing because one man's uh, liberal is another man's uh, restrictive. And uh, a very elegant way, of course, is with the use of uh, non-invasive monitoring to uh, target the amount of fluid to uh, the actual hemodynamics of the patient, the stroke volume, or the corrected flow time as a measure of preload. Uh, and when we look at uh, reviewing uh, evidence of goal-directed fluid management um, in abdominal surgery, uh, the most recent in, in the cystectomy patients, uh, showing uh, faster return of bowel function. Um, and one study in laparoscopy, which really had quite a different kind of approach, uh, a different, really different kind of protocol, did not show any, uh, any benefit in length of stay and did not look at um, uh, bowel motility uh, outcomes. Avoiding opiates, of course, uh, has come up many, many times, and uh, using NSAIDs as uh, opiate sparing, and also uh, because of the impact on prostaglandins, uh, has a, perhaps has an actual direct uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, but I think um, people have, uh, are, uh, are uh, concerned, I'd say, in the last year with uh, studies suggesting, uh, beginning with a study uh, from Canada, from Chris Schlachta in London, Ontario, uh, which was not, which just meant that he just looked at it as a problem in his study, uh, but it's turned out that other people have demonstrated what he demonstrated uh, with IV Ketorlach, um, which uh, other people have as well sounded the alarm here, and I think uh, many GI surgeons are, are concerned about this at this point. Um, and I think it would be something, uh, I know it's been discussed here already, but I would say we're quite, uh, we're concerned and we're, um, it's, on the, it's on our radar screen. Uh, early mobilization, of course, indicated for other reasons. Um, but when we have a patient with an ileus and an NG, we always tell the patient, can you get up, you know, get up and move around, get, get some, you've got to do your part, you've got to get up and get that gas going. Uh, but um, uh, it doesn't really uh, seem to have that impact, unfortunately, in, in healthy volunteers or affecting the duration. But we don't have very good studies. And uh, uh, so uh, rocking chair motion does seem to be beneficial, though, in one study. And other things like uh, guided imagery, acupuncture, uh, haven't been demonstrated to be effective. So in, um, of course, one of the goals of ERAS is making it easy to do the right thing, so getting all of these things into, uh, into, in, into practice. And when you put them all together, I think uh, there's good, uh, th it's quite consistent that the pathways uh, have a better, faster return of bowel function than, than uh, traditional approach. But uh, we don't be like uh, Bushy here and say that mission is accomplished when it's not accomplished. And I would say that ileus still remains one of our biggest issues uh, within the pathways. If you look at oral intake on post-up day two, it's achieved in about 65%. And the reasons why when it isn't achieved is partly no, most of it's nausea and vomiting, some of it's just for other reasons. But if you look at that number, it's similar to risk of vomiting uh, in studies of early feeding without a pathway. So I think that that's important information. Uh, if we look at our own data before uh, in, in comparing a, a traditional care, and Larry's gonna, I think, actually present this study uh, in the next session, compared to the pathway, uh, we did show a decrease in, in our complications, but our ileus symptoms didn't change, change at all. We were quite disappointed by that. 
And in, in, our, in our place, although our length of stay is low, ILIA still remains the number one reason for delayed discharge um, in, in, our, in our pathway. And we've recently changed a lot of what we've done in the pathway. We added things to, because of those things, to try to uh, do better. We, we, we've added some of the things we talked about yesterday, uh, gum chewing, magnesium, and we were studying this, but uh, I couldn't uh, convince my boss to buy this for us. He said, prove it to me in our context and then we'll talk. So he's, he's putting me off, he's delaying me, because I'm sure we'll show what everybody else has showed. Uh, this is uh, uh, prospective uh, data that uh, Gabrielle has been, been collecting and showing that even with our new pathway, about almost 40% of our patients will have some symptoms of ileus. And this is a very common uh, issue on our clinical teaching unit. So what happens is the patients are seen in the morning and the patient's distended and then the patient is kept MPO. So it's written in the chart that they're MPO, which means even if they're better an hour later, they still can't get uh, a diet and it definitely puts us off. Or, the, or in the middle of the night, what commonly happens is when they're vomiting, they get called in the night, nausea and vomiting, 70% of these patients will have an NG, and 40% it's removed within a day. So we have to question whether we could have sometimes ride it out. And I think that one of the key co concepts here is that it would be very helpful to have a standard, for standardizing your approach to the normal patient, we want to standardize our approach to when we need to intervene when things aren't going the way we want them to go. And so we, we've developed sort of a protocol for what uh, an approach to these symptoms for our house staff and for um, people taking care of these patients every day. Uh, and some of it is how uh, having a consistent definition, uh, what ileus is, um, having a consistent approach to making sure that it's a primary ileus and not secondary, uh, ha defining our indications for putting in an NG tube. Um, and uh, going through a list of other treatment modalities and, and that would be an interesting discussion because um, none of the, I'm not sure we have really a lot of data about the treatment of ileus, there's a lot of data about prevention, but once you have ileus, what to do until they get a CT with gastrographin and that may, that may help things along. And the concept of reevaluating this every day. So in summary, um, uh, post-operative ileus is considered, some degree of ileus is considered inevitable in a way and maybe it won't at some point, maybe that's a dogma or traditional way of looking at things uh, can result in undesirable symptoms in, in a, still a good chunk of our patients uh, that uh, these pathways are incorporating a lot of uh, current knowledge uh, into uh, prevention and shortening the duration of ileus. But it's still a problem in, uh, in um, about 40% of our patients exhibiting some of these symptoms after a colon resection. Uh, so I think that prevention and treatment of ileus have to remain very important areas of investigation within, uh, within the society and within uh, people interested in this and that the development of, of, of kind of evidence-based and systematic uh, approaches to having these contingency plans um, for, to help patients that, uh, that are falling off the pathway. So thank you very much.